Hi guys and welcome back to the Architecture Unknown podcast. Today we're going to be talking about race and architecture. This following the events in Minnesota with the murder of George Floyd and subsequent protests as well as recent surveys from the Architects Journal uh, and the Stephen Lawrence Trust suggesting that racism in the industry is continuing to increase and has done so by 10% since the 2018 survey. With me are the usual suspects, Dan and Charlie, co-directors of Architecture Unknown, but also we are joined by Architecture Unknown's first uh, guest, Selassie uh, Setifer, who is a public practice associate working as an integrated site program manager at Be First and co-founder of Black Females in Architecture. Uh, hopefully Selassie is going to help guide this discussion to Day. so thanks very much for coming on to the podcast mm. uh, but before we get stuck into our main topic here's our quick news round latest headlines today architects and designers have created a public google doc spreadsheet to highlight architecture and other practices in the construction industry founded by black indigenous and people of color the purpose is to raise awareness of jobs available uh, at these studios and for emerging architects and designers to apply to them mm. five statues have been posted on a topple the racist interactive map as conveners call on cities in the UK to remove monuments in the streets. However, some are questioning whether they have confused statues of Sir Robert Peel with his less well-known father, also called Sir Robert Peel, uh, who petitioned against the slave trade abolition bill in 1806. In Manchester, a street art mural in Stevenson Square has been painted by street artist Axie. I assume that's his tag name, in memory of George Floyd. It looks pretty spicy. I do recommend taking a look. Yeah, that's beautiful. London Met University has announced it will rename the Sir John Cass School of Art, uh, Architecture and Design to remove the name of the prominent slave trader. Alan Jones makes a return as president of the RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architects, having stood down in March following allegations to an extramarital affair. Naughty boy. And finally, according to recent surveys by the architecture unknown, racism in the profession is getting worse. Surveys showing that people with uh, like Asian minority ethnic backgrounds who find the profession to have widespread racism has increased from 23% in 2018 to 33 in 2020. This brings us to our main topic. So, Slassi, first of all, thanks for joining us. Um, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm pretty good. Just uh, glad to have... Uh, <laughs> someone else to talk to on here other than Dan and Charlie. <laughs> what are you trying to say? We're not fulfilling your needs. <laughs> you know it's all love. Um, so Lassie, could you tell us a bit more about yourself and the work that you currently do? Yes. So, um, like Sean said, I am currently working as Innovative Sites Programme Manager at B First. So B First is the London Borough of Barclay and Dagenham's um, wholly owned development company. Um, so it's looking after a majority of the development work and housing regeneration, estate regeneration work that um, Barkin and Dagenham is undertaking. Um, so they have in-house um, construction management teams, development management teams, and yeah, we client out the work to architects um, to do undertake design work for us. And then generally, um, all the projects are on sort of design and build contracts so then we also um, enlist contractors to you know undertake construction work yeah um, in addition to that in B first I'm also starting um, supporting the main teams in doing design management but my primary role is as like Sean said innovative sites program manager and the innovative sites program is essentially a small sites program so we're trying to find innovative solutions to bring forward these small tricky sites ex garage sites backland sites infill sites do something interesting and sort of really design focused and um yeah trying to introduce things like community-led housing and all those kind of things onto yeah, these sites. that's what i was going to ask i mean if it's not confidential what sort of client would you normally work for or work with on that type of project um, so this, uh, let me see, which part of it might be confidential? I don't, yeah. <laughs> Global government is all a bit like, What I can say right now is I've got that, the bleed button ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so these are council-owned sites, right? And right. they're sites that the council itself has found quite tricky to bring forward. In the past, 
obviously, as you know, as councils have started trying to be in the house building space again, some of these small sites have been delivered through the council, mm -hmm. but probably the, the sort of more straightforward ones. Yeah, yeah. And what is left behind are the cr pretty tricky ones. Not all of them are, say, for example, right now, I'm reviewing all the garage sites across the whole borough. Wow. So Barclay and Dagenham is one of those sort of um, outer London boroughs. It's still within London, but actually it's on the cusp of Essex. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably most famed in housing terms for the Beckentree estate, which is the majority of Dagenham. And it was at, in its time the first um, social housing and the largest social housing development in Europe. So, and it's very sort of cottage estate type of vibe. So there's a lot of garage sites. There's about mm -hmm. 140 something. So I'm reviewing all of them now to see what opportunity they are, there are for a possible development. But like I said, not all of them are appropriate for bringing forward as housing for all sorts of different reasons. Um, so one of the things that we would really like to do is community-led housing. Um, that is definitely not an easy thing to do, particularly in an area that hasn't, um, isn't one of those areas where that is a big sort of existing ask or something that people locally are aware of. So mm -hmm. I'm a local, actually, I was born and raised in Barking, still live here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really nice to be able to be working with Be First and the, the council locally, especially at a time where there's actually incredible amount of development happening in the area. We went to uni together. When I, before coming to Manchester, when I went to Portsmouth, I came back, come back home every time there was something different going on. Where I went to primary school is all different now. Um, mm -hmm. Where I went to secondary school is also changing vastly. The city centre is changing a lot. And there's a lot of development happening. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's great to be part of that. And is that sort of like development uh, with a capital D where it's all very much imposed or is there a much a more like a holistic approach to how the city and how you know how the area how the borough is changing? Um, I think the vision is definitely uh, an inclusive one um, that can be felt in even the restructuring of, of, of the council so before my time I've only been there a little while but be first is new it's three years old and before I think Be First was brought, brought about, I think there was a restructure in the council, which meant that one of the main departments that in, for which Be First is closely linked has now been um, established as the inclusive growth um, department. And that's sort of around yeah, place making, but also in, it's quite intersectional. So dealing with sort of place and I think housing and health mm -hmm. and all those things kind of intersect mm -hmm. um, and are plugged into different other areas of the council as well. So I think if you consider that, you start to understand where the vision of, of the, the borough is and right. where it's going. Um, Sounds like you're not coming back to uh, Manchester anytime soon. I come to visit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there to visit. Um, What's the pity? What's the pity? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so that's be first what cool. else was i supposed to answer <laughs> um we, what other stuff yeah, are you doing as well anything on the side um of interest so, you know <laughs> what else have i got going on so i'm also currently still um a reba council member um i have been for almost three years and in the first year I was Reba council member, I was also, well, first and second year, I was also um, co-president um, co for associates and students, students and associates. Um, and yeah, that, that's been an interesting and very eye-opening um, experience. I'm still there. Yeah. Um, eye-opening in, in what way, if you don't mind me asking? Just understanding governance and institutional governance and institutional bureaucracy and to be honest I probably wouldn't have um, ever thought to get involved in it had it not been for a mentor of mine Elsie Wusu. Um, through her I kind of started to understand the importance of 
being in these types of spaces contributing to discourse that's happening mm. and as a way to kind of help shape the profession um and yes it's been a very eye-opening experience definitely in in, in a lot of ways so yeah. we also know that you you know the your role with the bfa um has been one that we've seen on instagram and social media quite a lot advertised many times uh yeah uh we, we do like your stuff uh we'll put the link to it on this uh to this video uh, i think you've got over 200 members now um we've got we've got over 300 members now oh wow <laughs> well your website's out of date then. <laughs> yeah, it is. our website is out of date it is on the agenda of things to do god don't tell me we've, we've been trying to update our website and it is the most boring thing <laughs> hopefully it will be happening soon because um okay so i'll give you a rundown of bfa so yes. black females in architecture came about in 2018 so i Having moved back to London, like I said, I, I, I um, went on RIBA Council and yeah, I, I opened an experience. So one thing I didn't mention was that actually Elsie Owusu, who I, who I mentioned was my mentor, I was working with her at the time. Um, she was the one who encouraged me to set up my own business um, as a way to kind of circumvent a lot of the inequality within the industry mm. with thinking that mm. there is a lack of black owned businesses in the industry the more black owned businesses there are the more opportunity for those black owned businesses or BAME owned businesses to employ people that look like them hmm. right one of the big misconceptions is around or how how architecture schools make you feel like that you're the only sort of end goal is to be an architect meanwhile there's a whole host of things in between that you could be doing with the amazing um, sort of talent and insight and, and sort of problem solving way of thinking that you gain from being in architecture school. So um, one of the most encouraging things, it was just a simple thing she said, was that you don't need to call yourself an architect to operate in a built environment space. It's not something that should stop you from setting up your own sort of company, whatever that is, yeah. and offering your services because you, you know a lot of things mm -hmm. anyway, just by going through architecture education so that happened um and then yeah so that led on to me sort of seeking out um more events to attend to find more people in the industry because another thing as well they don't teach you is the power of networks mm. and <laughs> most <laughs> most people who are like me <laughs> look like me from the background that i'm from nobody in my family has ever studied architecture or anything in the sort of creative industries so there's no one to tell me or guide me on how to do what to do when to do where to do anything so the importance of network is of almost more significance the thing of um nepotism or sort mm -hmm. of just knowing someone to know someone and they can put you on and yeah. um, that's like not there at all so your network is a lot more um, important so with that in mind i was trying to get out meet some people just for no not not any to, not to any end really but just to meet and get to know people mm -hmm. and in doing so i bumped into um a lady called alicia fisher and i bumped into her several times she's almost just like me she's a little younger than me but looks like me from a similar background to me and that's quite nice to know yeah. um and then i also bumped into neba sere um and she at the time was co-found co she was a sorry she was um a trustee of um the architecture foundation so she was a young trustee and when i saw that on the, the af's website i was in the process of buying a ticket to an event and i saw that on the af's website it was quite I was really happy because it was like she's a young black woman i'm a young black woman she's a trustee of this organization i'm a trustee of this organization that reba she was yeah. af diff two totally different organizations but in the architectural space and i just it just really made me happy so when i went to this event i went and i don't know where <laughs> i got <laughs> i plucked up the courage to just go and speak to this random stranger we just had a chat 
we became friendly and she invited me to some of the events that they were hosting. And at that event, there was one particular event that they held, which was called part four. And it was exploring, um, it was a series and it was exploring sort of what happens post part three mm. and different people in the industry who have done interesting things outside of the sort of standard um, architectural practice. Um, and it was an interesting series. So I attended this one that Niba invited me to. Niba was hosting, again, a really nice thing to be able to see, a young black girl host, hosting an event held in, I can't remember, I think it was Jessica and Wiles, with an audience of what you would know what a typical architectural events audience looks like. Mm, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> um, on this screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no shade. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it was nice to see that I was there, Neba was there, but in the front, and um, Alicia was there at the event as well. Um, she had turned up, and I don't know how, I, I'm not sure if she had known Neba at the time. And then another lady, a Korea dancer, was there as well. She had heard of the event and just decided to go along and come to find out later that typically what would happen is if I found out about an event, I'll kind of try to get my other friends to come along with me and most more often than not they would kind of be like no I'm not interested <laughs> and then end up either having to go by myself and if I do go by myself by the end of the event I'm like racing out the door because I'm super shy and like yeah. don't know anybody or whatever mm -hmm. so this is what I feel was facing at the time um but Alicia was a familiar face Neva was a familiar face to me so we were the three of us were talking and then we spotted a queer looking like she's looking for the lift to get out of the place and we kind of requested her and the four of us just started chatting and we were chatting and chatting and chatting away till literally everybody had left we were still there chatting we decided to set up a whatsapp group to keep in touch and then yeah i added a couple of friends that i knew from from my undergrad in portsmouth i think alicia did the same neba did the same kriya did the same and they did the same and they did mm -hmm. different same and then it just became this sort of you know organic flow so, of nice people growing yeah. this <laughs> that so, what kind of outcomes have come from this and where do you see it going in the future and you know what 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 kind of goals are you looking to achieve or have achieved or you know is it just a fraternity a group of people who come together to help each other or do you yeah. have uh, uh, you know, do you have further kind of long-term <laughs> goals of aims and goals? What's, what do you see from it though? Yeah, so all, all that whole story was um, probably within three months of 2018. Um, by summer of 2018, this was like 30-something people. And we set up, the four of us set up another WhatsApp and started discussing and saying stuff like, you know, it seems like this is a thing and it seems like it's needed. How about we make a conscious effort to make it more of a thing? Um, so we did, we held some events and got people to engage and submitted uh, an entry for, I think it was some, some competition. Um, I think it was the British Pavilion. Mm -hmm. And then we we, we doing this, um, research into recycling plastic and reusing and remaking plastic into building material. We're doing all sorts of stuff. And then we decided, okay, this is a, a thing properly. By this time, we're probably a hundred and something members going on 200 members, registered the company, um, set out some aims and objectives and ambitions, set up some roles for the four of us. And soon after that, um, made a call out for uh, some committee members. I think there might've been like seven or eight committee members to help us sort of do all of these things that we were doing, trying to do. And we also put, um, got an advisory board. So all of those things are the things that are happening in the background. And in the foreground, we are hosting more and more events, exclusive events, particularly for our members, but then also inclusive events, sort of mm -hmm. more public facing events. Um, we are getting asked to do interviews and articles and write stuff and contribute to stuff, um, getting invited to host events or co-host events, um, getting 
um, people approach us to help them disseminate job um, roles to our membership. Um, yeah, and, and more stuff. <laughs> Getting invited to conferences or to deliver talks to at universities and yeah. Powerful stuff, powerful, very powerful. See, we, we knew you'd be comfortable at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, if people do want to join, uh, what's the be best method of doing so? Um, so we have an out of date website. <laughs> nice. It is out of date. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we have a lot of hair isn't there? So, yeah. Anyone on web developers? Someone <laughs> may or may not answer. We don't know. <laughs> Someone will always answer within at least seven days. Um, <laughs> as of now, if you go on our website and you want to be a member, it'll tell you. I think there's a there's a tab that says how to be a member um obviously you have to be a black woman black or mixed black black or black mixed woman to, to be a member mm -hmm. um but we have Char charlie me and charlie are <laughs> 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 but we welcome all supporters um and allies um sort of in yeah our bid to advocate mm -hmm. diversity inclusion in the industry uh, okay, so let's jump into our main topic. So with the recent events surrounding the tragic death of George Floyd in Minnesota, uh, it has certainly created a catalyst for the ongoing protests against police brutality all across the USA, UK and other parts of the world. It's also brought additional attention to the architect profession and the evident racism currently within it. Uh, between the four of us, we're hopefully going to talk through some of these issues. Um, in the news, we've more recently noticed that many monuments of former historic figures in British history have been deemed as racist for their lesser known exploits, which have helped them achieve certain things uh, which are not so publicly known or history would not like us to see. Um, and this suggests to us that public spaces uh, therefore inherently reflect cultural or social and economic ideals that are racist. So, Sassi, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what, what do you think of some of the acts of tearing down monuments of historic figures in protests of Black Lives Matter? Um, I think that a lot of action being taken is as a result of inaction or negative action. So had, had statues not been torn down, would we be having, for example, in the UK, in the UK, in London, um, a whole committee being set up to review all statues? Probably not. Um, so it might not be the PC way of handling things, but it has resulted in sort of big action that was very necessary. Um, yeah. And a challenge to that inertia that is in itself oppressive yeah you, you you said that it wasn't the most pc thing is that kind of in light of the fact that we are just coming out of well lockdown and you know fifteen thousand people some people would say grouping together is not necessarily the best way of protesting whilst it is their right to do so mm, i think it's it's a number of things definitely that and also in some places, thankfully not so much in the UK, but in the US, in, in, some, in some cases, some of those protests have sort of coincided or resulted in, you know, vandalism and rioting mm. and other stuff. So, and it is illegal to, I guess, deface public property or um, destroy a public property, property, right? So... Yeah, I guess that's what I mean by not PC. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, th I think there's a real kind of, I don't know, what I want to call it an issue in, in, in the British mentality of, um, of like the objection, not objection, but you know, change happens very slowly in this country, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not the same as the French who go out in the streets and really kind of properly protest. So it's, it's been really kind of interesting to see that real kind of, I wouldn't say anger, but you know, real kind of you know, energy coming out and looking for change. And I think, 
I think that, yeah, that is Charlie was saying that inertia. I think, I think nothing would have happened unless you really go the other way. It's like, it's like a pendulum. Something you know, if you want to get in the center, sometimes you got to really swing it that way to get that so it come back down again. I think that's what's happening right now. You know, I don't I don't see all the statues all being just eradicated overnight. Um, but that, like you said, that conversation has happened now, which is really important. Um, I think. I think as Sean touched on it as well about space as well and the spaces around some of these um, you know monuments or monuments, you know, being the actual space itself. Do you think there needs to be a conversation about how that space is and um, has been articulated over you know from you know the past? Uh, it's not just about a statue, but the space is about how who can occupy those spaces and mm -hmm. how do people certain people feel uncomfortable in certain spaces but not in others? What do you think about that? Um, I think it's a tricky question because of lack of education it's 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 a tough thing to really try and understand because many people will be in spaces that they don't realize have been oppressive to their ancestors for example mm. some people that do realize it are still in those spaces feel a way about being in those spaces but are still in those spaces and there's others who are just oblivious and kind of just don't care don't want to care or uh, whatever agnostic towards it all um so yeah how that then manifests into beyond the monument the types of spaces around that it depends where where the monument is i guess in a lot of cities those monuments are in places either as sort of public squares i guess and then they're the highlight of of that space that type of space would, would require, I don't know, what do you do? Do you replace the monument? Do you just rethink the whole space and place altogether? I, I don't know. Some other ones are in like sort of parks and, and things like that and are just kind of there next to a chair or a bench or whatever. And maybe they won't be so missed in those situations. It, it could just go and it wouldn't necessarily change or affect the space much. Um, Having said all of that, obviously for people who recognize exactly the significance of those statues in those spaces, the way it, they feel about that space will obviously change once those statues monuments are gone. Um, but yeah, so for someone who's oblivious to it, it, it might not necessarily make so much of a difference. It's like in the example of say the universities or, or, or other institutions that have been named after these, these, you know, people who were slave traders or with, you know, in that business, that's like a whole kettle of, another whole kettle of fish, right? Because it's not a statue, it's not a monument per se. There might be statues and monuments within those institutions, but the institution itself is a monument of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the people that are attending those institutions might well be sort of blind to that. Um, but those who are aware of it have definitely campaigned for, for many, many years to no avail. I know that there's um, something I watched recently, um, with, I think, yeah, Efwa Hirsch, I think, was speaking about it. She went to, I think she went to Oxford and she was speaking to someone mm -hmm. who also still goes to Oxford and they were talking about some monuments and things there. and you start to realize that actually the people have been petitioning, people have been doing the right thing in, in, in making efforts to get these things removed for the same reasons to no avail. So, um, That's yeah. That's the inertia again, isn't it? Yeah. The uh, more rebellious approach might uh, be quicker. So chucking the monuments in the river <laughs> I mean, it's might always... be a bit quicker than petitioning to uh, Although uh, I would say that it. it's right now it's, it's, it's sort of a pressure cooker right mm. and it's this multifaceted multi-layered situation yeah. i don't think toppling a statue and throwing it into the harbor could have had as much of an effect as it has had right now if you add corona if you add black lives matter if you add the death of george george floyd add the fact that this is 2020 and racism mm. is still so prevalent like if it had been any other time place or situation it you probably wouldn't have had these results happening you know i think that this has been an opportunity for so many people of, of every 
creed and color to reflect on their lives, the situations that they have found themselves in. You know, that restriction of freedom has, in, has been broken because so many people have had the opportunity to reflect on, as I said, it is 2020. We shouldn't still be dealing, you know, with this. This is, this is wrong and we need to do something about it now because, you know, I don't have the opportunity just to go back to work or and forget about it, you know, or listen, you know, on the tube to do something different. You know, I've, I'm here right now. I'm ready. I want to act. And I, I think that there's a, uh, I think that energy is, is so strong at the moment, which is, which is in a way is good. And it comes back to what you were saying, Slati, about it being a, a multi-layered thing, because mm -hmm. obviously it didn't happen last year. There were how many thousands of, of black people killed in America last year. Uh, and, and this year was the year, as you say, for so many reasons, but uh, the moment can't be denied. And I think that it was absolutely, um, the, the 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 you know the chance to change and I'm I'm really happy to see people take advantage take take that moment and grasp it and and, and use it uh, yeah and I hope it comes to to more structural change and I guess that's that's something that I want to ask about as well to zoom out from the sort of microcosm of like the monuments that everyone's talking about now and sort of zoom back out to you know to look at there's obvious overlaps big overlaps between inequality racism uh, and space and the spaces that uh, that lower income and often predominantly minority uh, communities occupy and their ability to to check to change those spaces uh, when the people who make decisions often don't represent them in both their history and um, of their views mm -hmm. so do you think that this moment will m manifest itself over time in change or do you think that we might end up still with the same situations arising again? Mm. Unfortunately I'm quite pessimistic on the topic. Um, I wish I could be a lot more optimistic but it's kind of as a result of evidence. It's not just something people are conjuring up right, it's evidence, it's, mm. it's hundreds of years of similar ish things after significant amount of oppression and constant fighting to or advocating against or protesting or whatever to try and make change happen and change is slow to come um the monuments could have a place if you wanted to celebrate someone for something that they did great or not or great in in, in hindsight after he's become um a multi-billionaire from his slave trade work there's a museum Mm. how you could easily clear out re return back artifacts and things that don't belong to you which were stolen or whatever mm. back to where they need to be and mm. in place have your monuments in where in that space that's easily done and that's probably what should happen um but yeah here we are um in terms of how that translates into the spaces and places in which people live and 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 people people of ethnic minorities not being reflected in sort of key decision making positions again that's that's a whole it's a really systemic issue which boils down from what might seem like the most simplest of things to over racism mm. in in that it's not really about equality because equality would mean giving someone the same chance to do something as the next person. But that doesn't work if one person is standing on a ladder and the other person is at ground level. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So what really needs to happen is really moving towards equity and, and justice at every mm -hmm. level um, in order that we can start to see some real change. But that's like real committed effort that needs to happen and I don't know whether that level of commitment that's required to get to that place is there unfortunately I think I think um, I almost question fundamentally what would be the drive what if people people act out of their own best interest right what would be the drive for the person on the other spectrum 
to want to really make the effort towards justice for the person on the other end of the spectrum. And so we sort of are at a place where we, we understand that helping fellow man, fellow woman is ultimately the most important thing. I don't know that we're going to be able to answer the question. And that's like maybe a very high for you to philosophical question. Um, you know, so you know us. <laughs> this is what I'm um, for. It, um, it, it takes yeah, us it takes us into our the next kind of topic which you've done perfectly by the way uh how we can kind of look at the profession how that's going to change in the next uh few years so you know generally speaking the industry is dominated by your typical white male uh, if you look at most of the successful architects in manchester um which makes it difficult for anyone outside of that white male category uh, to be successful uh in mm. architecture so um, what would you say are the biggest barriers now for people with a, a black Asian minority ethic background to be an architect? I think, again, it starts with education. So mm. first off, you're most likely to be encouraged to do anything and everything else but pursue a career in architecture. Careers advisors would typically not be encouraging you. I went up to my careers advisor and said, oh, I want to be an architect. And it's kind of like, mm, are you sure? <laughs> sure, it's not something else you want to do. I've heard people say, <laughs> um, I've heard people say that their careers advice has said, oh, well, have you thought about being a nurse? Or have you thought about whatever else the stereotypical image of someone who looks like me is doing, apparently, in society? <laughs> it's unfortunate, and you can't understand that this is happening in sort of memorable history to me. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I, I'm quite detached from sort of the school system, like secondary school system right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's still the same. There's that. And then there's also, um, you might overcome all of that. You get to university or yeah, most often you get to university and you realize that actually you're on a back foot. You don't have no clue. You had a passion about this thing because if I use myself as an example, mine was very much born out of a curiosity about space and place and how people use space. And that, I couldn't probably have ever articulated it back as a uh, 16, 17 or, no, I think I made, I decided I wanted to be, architect, be an architect from when I was maybe 15. So 14, 15, I definitely couldn't articulate it but now when I reflect about my motivations for wanting to do it yeah it was definitely about an in intrigue into space a very curious person I wanted to understand why we all live I live in a, in a um, neighborhood where it's a lot of terraced houses but my my neighbor's house is very different to mine even though it was very much the same and I wanted to be able to understand that my neighbor was a white man who had served in the army. He was really nice, loved his garden, he was super friendly. And I remember I was doing a history project, he invited me around and we had, I kind of interviewed him. And I was just thinking, hang on, this is like the same as my house, but very different. The way he uses his space is very different to the way my, my family use our space. Um, the significance of the, maybe the kitchen or the living room is di it's different how we use space. And that was really what intrigued me but come to university and that's not necessarily where I'm not getting that understanding of how everybody else is there people are there for all sorts of reasons people have already knowledge about how to draw properly or how to use software and CAD or whatever and you're forever playing this catch-up game and also a weird unlearning of your understanding of space and place because what you've grown up to know and understand about space and how you use space, particularly as someone from Af of African heritage. Um, I also lived in Ghana for, um, I'm of Ghanaian descent, I also lived in Ghana for about five years as a kid. And how the space is used, you know, how the significance of the kitchen and, and the veranda and the porch and how outside is an extension of the inside and street space and all of that kind of stuff is very different. And you, so in, in this, sort of institutional environment it's like almost an unlearning of what you confidently know just mm. from being a human with lived experience of space mm. 
what that means. Yeah. And in that, in that journey, you're supposed to keep up with what is being talked or what is expected of you as well. And if you consider that most of the tutors don't look like me, mm -hmm. I've, I came to the realization recently that I have never since living, I was born in England, brought up in England, bar the five years that I wasn't here. And I've never once been taught by a black person, let alone a black woman. Mm -hmm. And in architecture school, definitely not. Mm -hmm. So having to always try and make your understanding and representation of space fit somebody else's or fit the status quo is an unlearning of what you know. There's no one to help you build on what you already know and what you come with. Yeah. It's about you unlearning that and learning, getting on the bandwagon and keeping up mm. with the status quo. And that's, that's for me, I'm, and that's something that I'm starting to understand just now. It's not something I understood in undergrad or postgrad. It's a recent sort of reflection and understanding of trying to understand what's wrong with the situation that we're in and why we're in the situation that we're in. If you move, sorry. Sorry, do you, do you think then that, you know, the architectural world, well, especially in Britain, it's, it's, it's fundamentally, it's a white architectural world, aesthetically, or even architecturally, and, you know, white architecture and feminology is, is being taught in university. Pretty much. Yeah. Even, though, you know, it, like, it's, it, even it's, it's white, it's, it's, it's a white, obviously, I know where, you know, people say we're in Britain and it's, you know, it's what we are, but we're now a multicultural, um, you know, country, but on a cultural level, that doesn't permeate into architecture and um, you know like you said you know we, we still build in a very and design in a very kind of white you know british way and that doesn't that doesn't reflect the the, you know, the diversity that we have we have across you yeah. know, the board, across the whole country yeah and even if you did have more ethnic minorities studying architecture you that you'll be teaching them how to be a white male architect. Yeah, 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 basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. And at the end of the day, when it comes to getting in the space of practice and in the world, you you would choose the white male architect over the white male architect that you've created. Who isn't? Gotcha. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that suppression of of identity is is a really tough thing as well, and I guess comes at a very particular point in. Well, it comes in point of everyone's lives where that identity is still quite fluid. I know mine certainly was when I first started at university. I don't, and yeah. do you think that that, that that being almost forced into that mould changed in reflection the way you feel about architectural education as a whole? I mean, would you recommend taking on architectural education to other young black women? Yeah, this is a moral dilemma that I have, um, because on the one hand, I think it's great. I think we should shape the places and spaces that we inhabit and definitely have a more um, diverse profession, 100%. The part that really sort of um, I struggle with is, yes, the one, the one about the you, you needed to be so secure in yourself. And I think a lot of people are getting to be that way. I think younger people are definitely more that way than mm. I was when I was younger. I don't know, maybe the internet helps. All sorts of things might help, but I feel like younger people these days are a lot more aware. Although I still don't feel like it's fair to put so much pressure on such a young person to be able to like navigate such complex issues. I don't think it's fair. Um, but then if you add on top of that, the fact that it's just discriminatory and exclusionary on the access level, right? Um, it's a long course mm. and it's a lot of commitment. And it's particularly when the end is not certain. First of all, I think too many schools of architecture place the emphasis on being an architect and not all of the multitudes of things that you could do with an architectural just it's i think it's more about a way of thinking than anything else and you could do so much with that you learn so much in architectural school and i think there's not enough emphasis and encouraging of of, of all of those different things that you could do but then on top of that you add the so if everyone's of the view that i must be an architect but are coming out at different points and the key problem with architectural education is the attrition rate so 
right? We don't don't have too many people going in, but we have a fair m number of people going in compared to what's coming out. But at every stage, that proportion of people drops quite significantly. And the proportion of people that drop, sort of drop off, I don't want to call it drop out because like I said, every, you come out by the end of it, you've got two plus three, three-ish degrees, if you like. Yeah. That's, a, that's a lot of education for anybody. Yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. way that you should come out feeling at any point less than, do you know what I mean? But that's sort of built in as part mm. of this culture. Um, and if you're coming out at all of those points, part one, you come out and you can't find a job. It does, doesn't matter. It doesn't, it seems like no matter what you do, and I have first-hand experience with that, it seems like no mm -hmm. matter what you do, you're still not being able to do the bare minimum of what's expected of you and get an architectural assistant job. Um, so then what motivation do you have to go and continue? Let's not forget as well that many of, um, not all, but a lot of people from ethnic minority backgrounds the culture the culture is around sort of family and a unit so you're not you're never alone you're never singular you're always part of um a unit mm. right so you as a growing adult are to contribute to that unit right that's that's part of the culture you, you you're never singular by yourself so you going off to university in most cases not all it's an investment it's you going off to become a better person and someone who's going to you know help bring the family along to the next level contribute to the family support the family you come out of architecture school and you're not able to get a job that's problematic mm. um and it's a big it then begs the question what is is it a good return on your investment is going through architecture school a good return on your investment and <laughs> it doesn't seem that way to be honest, because on the base level, we can all agree that architects aren't very much valued in the architectural industry. We're underpaid for the value that we bring to the world. Absolutely. At, at any level. And if, you know, we white guys can agree with that. Imagine, <laughs> imagine, imagine everybody else. Um, and if you can't even, if you can't even get in to be able to get your foot on the door and get your step, your foot on that step, then is it, is it, worth anything um and if you do go through okay part one you go through part two same thing and worse um and if you finally come out the other side and you are in architectural practice then comes the the glass ceiling or the racism or all these other again sort of multi-layered things mm -hmm. that are happening which then begs the question and why i say it's like a moral dilemma how do i confidently encourage young black girls to pursue this career when I know that I've had to sacrifice quite a lot to be able to be here and to a certain point whilst I don't have the same level of, of privilege as others at least I had the privilege of not having to pay rent or pay for food or whatever or contribute to my household like that up until you know last year yeah. I could get by, I could be supported, even if it meant, you know, very minimal support. I did an uh, internship in Slovenia and it was unpaid and I wouldn't encourage anybody to do unpaid work. And I stayed in Slovenia without any pay. Okay, they paid for, they, they provided accommodation. But the only help I had was my brother sending me um, sort of spending money. And that was it. So, and that was a big sacrifice that he had to make to support me to make sure that I felt happy and confident to pursue this career that I want to pursue. Um, but no, but not everybody has that kind of privilege. So, yeah, it's a, it's a moral dilemma. Yeah, and I think that there's an extreme lack of understanding of the privilege that, you know, the, us three embody just by sitting here, and, you know, that it seems like there's a huge, there's even, I mean, architectural school is highly pressurized, but it seems like there's even more pressure to succeed when you come from a minority background, not just because you're, not just because uh, it's in architectural education, but also from the, the, the family side, but also from the molding your own identity into something more, in quotes, acceptable. Um, mm it seems like that that extreme pressure just it must take a toll 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, people are able to navigate it better than some, but I think setting up BFA has definitely unveiled that actually there's a lot more common negative experience, shared experience, than what one might immediately assume. Mm. So we have these um, events called living room sessions mm. with BFA, and those are one of our exclusive events. And the idea is to bring, well, initially the idea was to bring a handful of BFA members into one of the co-founders' homes in like a just nice, cozy, comfy setting and discuss different matters. So I think we first started off discussing architectural education and just education um, more broadly um, because we also, it's architecture, but it's the built environment and large. So we have planners and engineers and others in the, in the network as well. Um, and yeah, it was very um, heartbreaking to hear that actually there's a lot of common commonalities in the stories, even with the people who did great on paper at architecture school. Um, but it, the, 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 what was com one of the common things that w we found was that most had to reset or, re or, or resubmit throughout the entirety of, of their architectural education. And that can't be by coincidence, mm. for example. And then we had one around um, the job space and getting work and multiple people told accounts of having been discriminated against from getting a job because of their name, for example. You know my name. There is no English name <laughs> in my name. Typically, Ghanaians like to add in an English middle name. I don't have any. <laughs> um, and I did consider, definitely at part one, whether my name was a barrier into me at least getting an interview, if not the job, just at least the interview. And I, I was a, it was a question I had, but... I have evidence now that that's true. There's people who have very English sounding names in the network. And they've told accounts of, yeah, get in the interview, but once they're seen, it's kind of like, ooh. Because mm. um. it's going back to that unconscious bias that you were talking about earlier. Um, people associating with some of the similar uh, skin color, for example. I think like certainly what since, <laughs> Obviously, people have heard about Stephen Lawrence, who was an aspiring architect, who I think he's about 18, were when he was murdered in an unprovoked racist attack, but we all know that he was aspiring to be an architect. Uh, the problem is, back then, um, according to Sonia Watson, who's the chief executive of the Stephen Lawrence uh, Trust, um, she mentioned that at his time, he only had about a 1% chance of succeeding in the profession. I think that's obviously improved from now, but we're still far away from it being on equal terms. Um, and I think we still definitely need more diverse opinions in architecture. Uh, because when we start, you know, if we've got people asking the right questions about public spaces or monuments or housing and architecture to suit people um, with families of different cultures, then if we're not asking those questions, it's going to go wrong. So if London's got a population now of like, 45% of it is ethnic minorities. If you've just got um, a very, you know, a team of architects from a very similar white background all trying to design for them, I could see it easily going um, wrong. And we've certainly seen it with the, with the lockdown, mm -hmm. with some larger families culturally will have two to three generations of family in there, whereas a lot of housing is designed for a four person family. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'd, I'd certainly say that we need more diverse architects. I'd say if you are, yeah. or like you say, they just need more support in a way. Or, and that starts from the education, as you said, because you feel like you have to prove yourself or retrain what you know of space to suit someone else's. And that's just, yeah. that's wrong, yeah. isn't so, it? So if we appreciate in the first instance that the people that we're designing for are different, different cultural backgrounds, different a different level of understanding is needed to I, I, to understand how they use space if we're able to understand that from the outset because it's weird currently education beyond architecture is is already um yeah it's already messed up anyway but it's always thinking about the job at the end but even if in this case we're thinking about the job and how important it is at the end of it you understand how people use and inhabit space then 
maybe that might help us move away from talking to death about like Abusi or Mies or whoever else and really appreciating and understanding other people's contribution to architecture. But unfortunately, most of the history books don't really talk about other people's contribution outside of Western architecture, which is problematic, especially when you're going to be designing for people, yes, in a Western context, but from other cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. it, the whole thing is a wash of yeah. complex problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like I, I reflect on architecture school that, you know, especially in my first degree, as you say, there's complete lack of understanding of a broader historical context for architecture across the world. But equally, you're missing and are not taught core skills when it comes to engaging with the world, like listening and careful communication and understanding the complex, you know, um, the, you know, the complex realities of life. Mm -hmm. You know, that was started to become part of, I think, our education in particular, mm -hmm. due to the, the sort of um, context of our course but that wasn't mm. even true for some of the other ateliers on our course and exactly. certainly not in a wider context um, and so there's a it's just a complete misalignment of core skills and background knowledge that lead to a, an unhealthy and, and and completely unjust as you say to bring it back to justice outcome for so many people yeah Teresa okay yeah so, so how, i don't know how we change that narrative well i've got some ideas but yeah <laughs> um i think they're in the questions that we're all posing here and all those solutions but yeah selassie how would you like to see the profession or architects practices change over the next five years in response to the global protests uh, and the current challenges within the profession and the built environment um i think there's there's a lot that can be done mm. um i think becoming more aware of unconscious bias is one step in the right direction um when sort of publicizing work or putting out tenders or all of those types of things the emphasis on on um ensuring that whoever's applying for those roles are taking sort of diversity quite seriously Particularly, particularly in, in, in situations where you're dealing with diverse communities, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be procuring diverse teams, right? For, for, to, in, to be able to ensure that you have the outcomes that meets the needs of your community. Um, and the way that people do that, I've heard loads of excuses like, oh, we don't know where the diverse um, practices are, or we don't know where how to we've, we've put out this public um, um, job application for example and people from diverse communities aren't applying um, it's that thing of equality versus equity and justice mm. I think a, a little bit more effort is required because so much other stuff has happened in the background which has for one reason or another caused the situation to be that yes the, the person might be very much capable of executing a job but made to feel unqualified or incompetent in doing so. So therefore, why would they apply? And I think generally there's definitely a lot of, more, a lot of statistics out there that will prove that white men are more, more likely to go for, for positions that are above and beyond what they're actually seen as capable of, and they'll probably get it. You just have and to look at the cabinet to prove that. <laughs> and then, and then, and, and, and that's a... a, a a gender problem, a race problem, a class problem, mm. all in one. So if you mount all of those things on top of each other, then as a black woman, where how likely are you to go for that position? Um, so more effort is needed. And that effort can look like, you know, appro approaching groups. There are a lot of groups emerging. Since we, we were founded in 2018, in the same year, there was also Paradigm. Paradigm is a, a, a BAME um, network for in the for, for built environment professionals there's that there's so many others there's so many other initiatives so many other organizations that you can contact um as a means of finding out what to do or or get or con getting them as consultants to help you in doing what you want to do and that, another thing we need to really try and get away from as well is 
trying to have somebody else put in that work that you should be putting in. If it's to approach a group like ours to help you address that problem that you have internally, that's consultancy work that you should be paying someone for. <laughs> um, we're not out here just um, spending time, sleepless nights, evenings, mm -hmm. weekends, um, everything else to try and make change in, in, the, in, the, in the industry for somebody else to reap at the end of it and not contribute back into what we're trying to do. It's a collective effort. I appreciate that some practices may not know what to do, but I find it inherently problematic if a practice that is all white staff, probably quite low on gender equality, talk less of racial equality, asking another white person, for example, how to solve a diversity issue makes no sense back to the problem creator <laughs> it, it makes no sense um but that's just that's just some some sort of entry level things that you could do um and then yeah just getting to understand really the the root of what the problem is and yeah advocating for those things to change for the systems of education to change and I think that our architectural practices have a lot of power in that because the people coming out of education are going into practices. So if they were to be demanding different from the people that are coming out of education, I think stuff can start to be changing. Um, and yeah, it's also on, like I say, local authorities and government. I think Sadiq Khan um, put in um, some sort, in his good growth um, initiative, put in some sort of... Um, rating for um diverse diverse teams as part of the procurement and it's things like that that from sort of a top down level that helps to start making some changes mm. um, and where you might have a tender for a job and you see that your the people applying for the job aren't diverse at all don't just take it as oh well these are the people that applied what else can you do to make that different either the next time or in this time um yeah i'll leave that there I know we're obviously tight for time. I'm glad you picked up on the tender thing. It's a bit of a mad scenario where the guys who get selected for tender are the ones with the experience to do it, but the ones with the experience are typically uh, the you know, mm -hmm. practice led by uh, uh, white males. So it's difficult for diverse practices to get involved with something like that. So it's it's a yeah. odd thing. I think there's a there's a lot of the, you thinking outside of the box and ways to overcome that. You could easily. Um, pair up a, a small practice with a larger more established practice for them to help support them in in the, in, in gaining experience and knowledge and insight into how mm -hmm. things are done at that scale mm -hmm. but then also you would most definitely bring in sort of more creativity and flair to whatever it is that you're doing so it's a win-win situation so there's no reason why that couldn't happen yeah. yeah and can I just say before we move on um thank you for putting into words that really that key concept of equity versus equality i've not heard it phrased like that before and that really i think if anyone who's listening wants to take anything away from this podcast that idea of the difference between equity and equality which selassie so eloquently explained and on which this whole podcast has been founded i think is 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 one of the key messages and uh, i think uh, yeah thank you so much for that yeah. Um, yeah, but that being said, as we've seen, often in the midst of difficult uh, times and strife can emerge some uh, powerful movements and moments uh, in which one hopes we are living uh, at the moment that will come to real change. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much, Selassie, for your time uh, and for being here and talking about uh these issues with us it's been uh it's been a real pleasure and as i said earlier thank, thank you so you. much thank you for the invite <laughs> hopefully there'll be more yes absolutely <laughs> hopefully we can do a, a catch-up uh, in a year's time and reflect on all the successes that have come out of uh recent protests yeah so lassie's already said she's not uh, not an optimist <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't mind getting get proven wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's, let's hope we get proven wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah in, a, in a positive way, not a more negative way. Yeah. <laughs> <Positive>. <laughs> uh, 
All and right. um, on that note, guys, um, till next time. Yeah. If you've had any thoughts about the uh, the podcast today, you want to comment uh, or subscribe, we would love to hear your opinions. All, all the links will be posted below, but also on this podcast as well. So, um, so some very kind of positive literature, positive websites, um, yeah, you know, that would be discussed. So please, please educate yourself further. And, you know, if you have comments on it, please let us know. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.